namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Aparuta de Sangamatasa Tawara, ye sort of one tab a moonshan to Satan. So, uh, this evening I've been invited to give the Dhamma talk. And of course, as you all know, I just returned from a three month. Uh, journey <clears throat> in which I left uh, here on the 6th of November and came back on the 2nd of February. So this uh, went to many countries, to India and uh, Thailand, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia in three months. And of course, I, when I travel, I go by invitation, so I'm always the center of attention, a continuous, ongoing, relentless attention. <clears throat> so I had uh, cataract operations a couple of weeks ago in Bangkok, and uh, I was really looking forward to having my, these operations, because then it's a good excuse <laughs> to hide away. So, <laughs> so there's a very good eye hospital in Bangkok, Rutten is an eye hospital, and they, they've been looking after my sight for, for years now with uh, macular degeneration and, and then uh, cataracts. So you can see I'm not wearing uh, glasses like I used to. <clears throat> but I still uh, need glasses for reading. So that's quite amazing, the miraculous uh, modern technology in regards to medicine because uh, at my age, at 75, 76, one is, uh, uh, has better eyesight than at 40. So that's, <laughs> they, they remove your, your lenses and put in plastic ones. So I'm moving more into the bionic man <laughs> period of my life. <clears throat> so this is, uh, visiting all these different places. Uh, in India, of course, uh, India is always a fascinating country. And uh, I went to uh, Chennai first to give a retreat at the Theosophical Society. And then uh, from there to Varanasi, where we spent uh, one of my favorite places on this planet in all its chaos and confusion. Uh, is if you're European and like order and, and rules, then you'd be totally frustrated in Varanasi. It seems like total chaos, but yet it seems to work. So it was uh, it's one of the most exotic, colorful places and endlessly interesting to visit. And of course, I've been supporting the education of two uh, uh, Indian girls there for the past six years. And they've, uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen them for six years. Uh, so now the eldest one is about 12, 13 years old, and the youngest one about 10. And uh, I went to see their school and their accommodation. They were two, uh, their mother's a widow, 
who lived out on the kind of in the open, a homeless family on Athigat in Varanasi. And uh, she had, when Ajahn Janto and I were there six years ago, we, we met them and uh, she had two teenage sons uh, and then uh, these two little daughters, one with about four and the other uh, seven. The two girls, she wanted the two girls to be put in some kind of boarding school, so uh, we arranged it, uh, and I visited the school, a uh, very good school actually, in Varanasi, uh, and also they uh, have accommodation at a hostel that's funded by some German uh, foundation. <clears throat> so I checked out their accommodation, talked to their teachers, they're doing very well. They're both very pretty girls uh, with uh, developing poise and uh, uh, they seem to love the school they're in. Um, they wear very smart looking school uniforms. <laughs> anyway, it was a joy to, to see them and to also be, as the first time I had a chance to return to India just to see exactly what, you know, what is going on there, what the school is like and how they are doing. So those of you who have contributed to the Indian School Girls Fund, just to let you know, <laughs> it hasn't been a waste of money. It's, uh, they're doing very well. <clears throat> That in India, of course, it's, uh, we, uh, Varanasi is not, it's only a few miles from Saranath, which is where the Buddha gave his first sermon, the Tamajaka Pavatana Sutra. And that, of course, is uh, the one that we chant the most here, the uh, Four Noble Truths. So that was, uh, we all went, uh, Pei and Dayamin and Ajahn Panyasaro and Richard Smith and and we took the uh, widow and her four children. She's got five. She's got another daughter now, and uh, she's remarried, by the way. <laughs> and uh, we took them all with us to Saranath, and that was uh, uh, a very inspiring time because uh, we all sat in front of the stupa, the ancient stupa where the Buddha was supposed to have given his uh, first sermon after enlightenment and chanted the uh, Tamajaka Sutta. And it's uh, so inspiring to think that 2,553 years ago the Buddha gave his first sermon in that very place there and then that many years later we're chanting this same sermon. And of course, this is uh, this sermon. I think is a, is a perfect teaching. It is uh, all you need to know for enlightenment is contained within that uh, one sutta. And the fact that it was given so long ago, two thousand five hundred fifty-three years ago, for most of us is a long period of time. And uh, the teaching itself was uh, one that uh, is based on uh, the common experience of suffering, of dukkha. And so this is, this is the uniqueness of uh, the Buddha Dhamma, is that uh, in a, as, as a religion it functions almost in a different way than any other religion, because it, it doesn't talk about God or metaphysical truths, but it's pointing to uh, the most common human experience that we all share. And by investigating that, we realize ultimate truth. And of course, this, uh, when the Buddha was enlightened in um, Bodhgaya, he uh, 
uh, it occurred to him that it, what he learned is, is impossible to teach. Enlightenment and Dhamma, you can't, you know, there's no kind of method or convention or any way that really defines it or describes it. So this is what, you know, my constant reference to it's an intuitive reality. It's something to be realized, recognized, not something to be defined and described. So then the, uh, you know, his thought was there's no point, you know, we can't possibly teach this because language itself is too limited. Language, uh, thinking process, these are all conditioned uh, experiences that we have and they can only take you so far. And so what, how can you teach if you have, if there's no way, no, no way to uh, describe it. So then in his arrival in Varanasi, where he met his five uh, fans, his colleagues who deserted him when they thought he was no longer uh, practicing in the sincere way that he used to, uh, he gave them this first sermon, which is, there is uh, suffering, there are the causes of suffering, there is the end of suffering, and the there is the way or the path of non-suffering. So it's taking suffering uh, and using it for investigation, reflection. So this is, a, this is the unique quality of Buddha Dhamma, taking something so obvious, so undeniable, so ordinary to every human being and making that into a noble truth to be understood and then reflected on till you see the, how, it, how you create suffering. When you let go of the causes of suffering, then you realize the end of suffering. And then you, real, then you develop or cultivate the way of non-suffering. So this is an, a very ancient teaching, and uh, I did feel incredibly inspired at Saranath when I was there, uh, because they made it into a very beautiful kind of park. And when I was there in 70, 1972, when I went to Tudong, a walking in India, 1972, it was the first time I went to India, uh, the Buddhist scenes, the holy pl Buddhist holy places were, were not very well kept. They were just kind of let to, left to grow wild with weeds and uh, there were very few, you know, they, you could just walk around the stupa. Uh, there was no guards, no gardens, no lawns. Uh, and I did chant the Padimokha there, I remember, in, in front of that stupa. That was in 1972. <clears throat> so these are, this is a way of reflecting on the way it is, on Dhamma, and uh, traveling fra from India to Thailand and then uh, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, you're going, in, going into Asian countries now that are very well developed, modernized. Uh, Varanasi still has this sense of antiquity, uh, of being an ancient city, but other than that, uh, you go into Bangkok or Melbourne, Sydney, uh, Wellington, Auckland, Kuala Lumpur, <laughs> and they're all incredibly modern, uh, affluent places. So in, uh, I used to live in Malaysia before I became a monk in Sabah, the uh, state of Sabah in the, on the island of Borneo. And, the, and then I went there several years ago just to return to the place I lived in 
in uh, Sabah, but uh, spending time in Kuala Lumpur and Penang, you realize what a kind of modern, uh, rather amazing country Malaysia has become. It looks very well ordered, beautiful, and Kuala Lumpur has become quite an elegant modern city. And there, uh, they, at this time, there's an incredible interest in uh, Theravada Buddhism, especially the Thai forest tradition amongst uh, Chinese Malaysians. Uh, and uh, in Kuala Lumpur, of course, the, this is the capital city, uh, and it is, uh, there was, uh, we have a supporter there who's, who's been very generous to this monastery, and he arranged, uh, I gave a retreat in, in the uh, Genting Hills outside of Kuala Lumpur, a very beautiful place with very good weather, no mosquitoes, and beautiful venue. And, and uh, this man's whole family attended. They're very eager to learn and very uh, attentive and uh, very easy to teach. Now, this is quite a change also to see uh, the change in the Chinese Malaysian communities, which say uh, when I lived in Sabah and traveled in Malaya in 1964, 65, this was not, they were not interested or really knew nothing about Theravada Buddhism. So this interest in uh, meditation and uh, especially in, in meditation and, and in spiritual development because we all recognize the, the affluent world that we live in is uh, with all its advantages and perks that we can enjoy also is not the path of non-suffering. And so, you know, we, we hear the news and of the political problems and economic problems of, of every country. And now the media is so immediate, so quick, that you can uh, find out what's happening in Uganda or Mozambique or someplace <laughs> so remote that you would never, you probably never heard of before. So they, but all, it's always about suffering. Of course, the, the terrible uh, earthquake in Haiti, I think, is one of the most shocking uh, uh, natural disasters that have happened for years. And uh, just to see how, what a realm that we actually live in, in which the uh, uncertainty, insecurity uh, uh, that we experience in both our own physical bodies and in the, on the planet that we live on. Because now is a time where there's so much talk about uh, uh, degeneration of the environment and uh, the uh, greenhouse effects and the melting of the glaciers and then there's earthquakes and weather changes. And then, of course, at my age, you're very much aware of the uh, aging process. So, um, this, uh, these are ways of reflecting on the way it is, that, that when we're looking for happiness in some kind of permanent way uh, or security, through material wealth or through institutions or finding the right person or whatever, then we're inevitably disappointed because uh, this realm that we live in, the conditioned realm that we experience through our bodies and senses, is its very nature is unsatisfactoriness because we have to live in a realm of insecurity and relentless, inexorable changing that we have very little control over. So this is why the First Noble Truth is of dukkha or suffering because the human, ignorant human being wants happiness and security. We want to feel safe and secure. We would like to be happy rather than suffer. 
Uh, we think that having lots of money might make us feel secure or make us happy or finding another, the right person uh, that we can uh, uh, complete ourselves with by depending on another human individual. Uh, and yet all these, with all their uh, blessings and, and assets, not to, to put them down, but they are also in this process of change. The very nature of phenomena is a nature or change. So in my lifetime at this age now where you look back over the years and uh, you realize you know how, how changed the world is from what it was when I was a young person. <clears throat> and uh, the, just in seeing the changes in Thailand, for I went there first time, I think 1964, or, as a tourist. And then uh, <clears throat> Bangkok in those days, in the 60s, didn't have any tall buildings. <clears throat> I think the tallest building then was about four stories high. <clears throat> And now it's uh, it's kind of uh, skyscrapers, high-rise buildings, um, glass towers, and so forth everywhere, and motorways and viaducts, and it's uh, like a futuristic city compared to what it was like 1964, where it was more like an Asian city that was kind of. Uh, I heard once it used to be called the Venice of the Far East. But in 1964, I, I couldn't uh, possibly consider it anything like Venice. <laughs> but uh, it was certainly not, a, you know, an impressive city in its, in its architectural buildings, except for maybe the, the Buddhist temples, which were which are still present, but now almost dwarfed by the high-rise buildings. So in, in just 75 years of life, the changing position of the, my own uh, birthplace, the United States, uh, rose up to be a superpower and is now fading out very rapidly. <laughs> Uh, saw the end of the British Empire and the <laughs> uh, Second World War and on and on like this. So these things are now, for most of you, ancient history. Uh, but for me, they're memories. Memories that I still uh, can uh, remember, still have. So then we this uh, teaching of the Buddha has a, is supposed to have a lifespan of 5,000 years. And of course in 1956 it reached the halfway mark which, and then uh, so now we're on the, the downhill slide, the uh, other side, the exhalation. And at this time also we can see that that, that the teaching itself is, is, uh, has never been corrupted or changed. It's uh, simple enough in its form for Noble Truths. Uh, it still works. It, you can still, it's still usable. It's not some antique for the Anthropological Museum. And uh, so that it is a the Buddha did establish a teaching that cannot be corrupted and, and therefore a tradition, a uh, monastic tradition to carry the teaching from that time in India to the present time. So just contemplate that, that this is uh, taking something so but now, so common 
as suffering. And that, taking that and then investigating it. And so this, uh, of course, the, the ignorance of the human mind is that we, we form identities. We identify with the conditions that we're experiencing. So we, uh, when, we, when we don't reflect and we're not mindful, then we become the very things that we're, we become our memories, our physical form, the age of our bodies, we become, we have nationalities, uh, we become whatever we think we are. And so the cause of suffering is this attachment to conditioned phenomena ignorance and attachment to the body, to the mental states, the emotions, the memories that, that we all have. And so the way of mindfulness is, is the only way out of this dilemma at this time, in this, in this form, because we have to live our lives within the changing conditions of the uh, sensory realm that we're experiencing. So a human lifespan, say, even if it's up to a hundred years, is the experience of change. And change isn't always going to be good. It's going to go up and down. So things get better, then they get worse. Change is about birth and then death, beginning and ending. So then the mindfulness practice, the sati sampachanya satipanya uh, style of the Theravada scripture of the Pali uh, canon is a very skillful uh, teaching which encourages us to open up and look at suffering rather than seek for happiness to really investigate this experience of consciousness in a sense realm, the way it is. So we, uh, you know, not, we would like it to be, so we'd like it to be heaven, you know. Most of us would like to arrange our lives so that we're always happy and healthy, young and uh, successful and a beautiful place with all the best of the senses and emotional experiences. But it's like in Haiti at this time we hear the most, you know, dismal, grim, uh, horrible news of, of uh, thousands of people, hun several hundred thousand, I think it's up to three thousand, three hundred thousand people dead in just uh, the movement of the earth. An earthquake. And of course Haiti is I've never been there, but it is, seems to be the most uh, unfortunate country on this planet because <laughs> it always seems to be going through terrible traumas, uh, either through human-made ones or natural catastrophes. I always think it's a good reflection uh, not to become, you know, to to suffer from this recognition of suffering because we're not grasping suffering and wishing it were something else. We're understanding it. So then the direction we're looking at is not outward like my suffering is because of, the, of being persecuted from outside or not, uh, you know, or something going wrong like an earthquake or a volcano, tsunami or a disease. But it's the suffering uh, that I experience, that, is, that I create, is through ignorance of the way it is, of the Dhamma. So this very realm then is suffering, its very nature is change. Or dukkha, the Pali word dukkha, uh, means that which is, uh, you know, unsatisfying, unsatisfactory, lacking, incomplete, insecure, and that implies change. So, then our relationship to, to dukkha 
is not through trying to get rid of it or to find happiness, but to understand dukkha. And of course, the direction, the Thai forest tradition, uh, they use this word do jit, which means look at your look at look here, look at yourself, look at your mind. And of course, this is a. When I first went to stay with Lung Po Cha uh, years ago in Thailand, uh, I didn't know the language at all. And when I, the first year I was there, trying to learn Thai, and um, and also they spoke in the northeastern dialect, so I found it incredibly frustrating uh, trying to learn uh, Central Thai, which is the kind of lingua franca. And then the then the northeastern dialect at the same time, and then uh, you know so I but I did as I did pick up things, little little succinct statements that would kind of stick in your mind, and one of them, of course, was do jit, which is look look at your mind. And then Lung Po Chao would always point here to himself to his heart. He wasn't asking us to look at him. <laughs> it's a, a sign, isn't it? Of don't look out there. Don't blame the world for your suffering. Look here. This is where the causes of suffering arise and cease. And so I, you know, I found this just this simple uh, in Thai. It's just do jet two very uh, monosyllabic words. <laughs> Uh, it didn't take a great skill in the Thai language to get the point of that. <clears throat> and then also, the mantra Bhutto uh, they teach, which was translated into Thai as Puru, which means the, the knowing, the one who knows. The knowing of suffering in the present. So these are, you know, these I could pick up on even before I had any any ability to communicate sufficiently or intelligently in the Thai language, uh, because these were the words I heard and seemed to be, uh, you know, commonly uh, ways of describing the common way of describing the practice. So this is uh, like the looking at the first noble truth, isn't it? It's looking. You know, we can. With the ignorant person's always blaming external things. It's I'm suffering because of my body. Uh, I'm I have uh, old age. Uh, I'm uh, you know because somebody uh, is, has uh, some grudge against me and is abusing me, or because of the weather, or because of whatever. You know, it's always we can think we suffer because of external impingement and external things. But with mindfulness, then we're no longer seeking uh, uh, to blame the conditioned world for our suffering, but we're awakening to, through, through awakened attention, through mindfulness, and then do jit practice of looking at what's going on inside you. And, and at the body itself, in this way of observing its nature, all conditions are impermanent and not self. So this is the constant refrain and teaching uh, as exemplified in the Four Noble Truths, the Dhammajaka Pavatana Sutta. So over the years, this uh, I learned to understand the language and uh, better and uh, then I began to but the, during the first year I could it took me it's a very it's not an easy language to learn uh, for most of us if you you know it's not like a European language in any way so you have to uh, kind of apply different ways of, of you have to listen to it and and try to uh, get the feeling for it. It's more intuitive than, say, prescriptive grammar. It's more like a, 
a tonal language like Chinese. And so you, you have to learn how to listen to, to tones and in a way that you do, that, that say in English the tone doesn't make any difference, doesn't make the meaning any different, where in Thai the tone you use can get, make the, a totally different meaning with the same sounding syllable. So this is the winter's retreat time and of course it is a time for uh, this kind of contemplation, reflection. Now, this word reflection, as I use it, uh, notice that, that it is, our people sometimes wonder, is it thinking? It's not about thinking. It's not about thinking about the Four Noble Truths or uh, analyzing them, but it's um, the, the, first, the first aspect of the First Noble Truth is a statement, it's words like there is suffering. The second is suffering should be understood. So this gives you the reflective form. So I say, you're looking at your mind, you're no longer blaming any external causes for suffering, but you, you feel this sense of lack or dissatisfaction or uh, whatever, you know, something you want to get you don't have yet, uh, something you have that you don't want. And then you, you observe and begin to, that which is aware of suffering is not suffering. So this is the ability to discern. This is wisdom, in other words. Panya, or wisdom. Ability to discern through mindfulness uh, suffering, recognize it. In other words, it's not it's not criticizing, analyzing, blaming, adding to the suffering, but it's discerning it. To suffering, there is suffering. There is a sense of anxiety, maybe, or worry, or incompleteness, unsatisfactoriness, loneliness, uh, regret or guilt, or whatever form it takes in the, in the human consciousness, in our consciousness, we tend to, you know, when we're not awake and aware, we tend to uh, worry about life and affluent, that's one of the sicknesses of affluent societies like this one is worry about the future. Anxiety, worry, hang on us, hang about us, even when we have uh, security and comfort. Because this realm, its very nature, is uncertain and insecure. And if this is all there is, is just trying to, to make, trying to make the insecure secure, we, we are well set up for increasing disillusionment and despair as we grow older. We don't learn from life. We don't have insight. We do not have investigated. We merely become disappointed. Or then there's always the inevitable death. We all have to die. And that can be a source of anxiety. Or many people say they don't worry about dying, about death itself, but the process is, uh, you know, you're thinking of uh, what will happen, am I losing my memory, am I, uh, you know, do I, I had a physical examination in hospital in Bangkok and they did these ultrasound tests and all these modern technology with the latest med medical equipment to find out uh, what's going on inside this ancient old body. And, and you think, there must be something, you know, tumors or something. I mean, that's 75 years, 
you know, it's a long time for one of these forms, and uh, surely there's something terrible li- l- lurking and latent in there, but they didn't find anything. But it does, you know, I could worry about that. You don't have cancer now, but I could in the future. And so it's possible, isn't it? And then, and then, then the inevitable death of the body. Maybe it'll be painful. I was telling someone, we all like to die, and you know, I'm kind of proud character, and, and I don't, and anything I hate is losing my dignity. Feeling, feeling humiliated and losing dignity. Uh, this is my personality, dreads most, losing dignity. And then you think of, as you get older, you lose control over your bowels, your bladder. You mean that with people giving you nappies to wear <laughs> and sticking tubes in all your orifices and doing all kinds of weird things to keep the body going. Uh, and, um, you know, then you have lose, you have to give up your dignity and just kind of surrender to whoever, whoever the doctor is or the nurse or whatever to perform the necessary acts of prolonging the life of this form. So then in terms of do jet, isn't it? Look at the mind. And so this, this carries you through to death. I haven't died yet, but it works at least for the aging process and for sickness, pain, uh, and all the other problems uh, that one experiences in this realm as a sensitive uh, sense form in a sense realm. Now, it's very important for you to, re- to really notice this realm is like this. This is a sense realm. That, you know, what we're looking at now is all about sense sensitivity, sensuality. Sensitivity is, is about pleasure and pain, isn't it? It's what pleases or displeases, liking and not liking, wanting and not wanting. This planet is a, is a, and, and life on this planet is all about sensory experience. The atmosphere, the environment, the air, the earthquakes and tsunamis and all the rest. This is, this is the nature of this realm that we're experiencing. Going through its Vipaka karma or its inevitable changingness. So whether it's planetary or, you know, whether it's just this planet Earth or it's the sun and moon or the, the uh, solar system or, and then it goes on ad infinitum to, to who knows where the end of the universe is. Or are there other universes beyond our universe? And then we find ourselves that it's a kind of pathetic little creature sitting here, breathing. And how are we supposed to relate to this vast, mysterious universe that we can observe? You know, and what's it all about anyway? What is there, you know, people question, are there other planets in, the, in this uh, vast universal system that have uh, human life on them like this? And so we wonder, are we the only freakish planet that can sustain uh, uh, human life or animal life or sense, sense life as, as it does on this planet? But of course, we could speculate, we can seek the answers by sending rocket ships out into, into the universe to try to find out. Or, we can look at our minds. And, uh, and so this was the Buddha's approach. It's something we can all do to, to build rocket ships and, uh, and so forth is uh, not within my 
ability. Uh, and it is, it's only fairly recently developed. But back in India 2,553 years ago, uh, I'm sure nobody was even thinking about rocket ships or Mars or going to the moon, but living within this human form on this planet and using this experience to learn, to discern, to to recognize, to notice, to awaken, to Dhamma or the way it is. And then Dhamma is, is not, cannot be described. The best you can do is discern. There's, the, there's the, the Dhammas of the changing conditions and there's the Dhamma, the unborn, uncreated, unformed. And so the the Buddha recognized that through awareness, through mindfulness and clear comprehension, through observing, not through defining or analyzing or criticizing, but through just the simple intuitive ability we have to observe, be the puru or the puto or the knower, and so that's the whole, that's the, that is the essence. That is the gate out of suffering. Door to the deathless. Now going, you know, just, I found like in living, being trained in Thailand, with uh, Lung Po Cha. Because uh, the culture is a very Buddhist, uh, you know, it's a very, it's kind of basis, foundation is Buddhism. Uh, unlike European culture, which is, is not. So you're living in a country that is, whether Thai people understand Buddhist teaching or not, something else. But culturally, they have a foundation of wisdom, of, of wisdom underlying their culture, uh, you know, that is there. Uh, and so, uh, maybe not recognized or appreciated, but it's there. And so living with somebody like Ajahn Chah, uh, he was not idealistic about life. Uh, he wasn't you know, judging things about how they should or shouldn't be, but always pointing to the way it is. And so I found this of great benefit in my own practice because my background is very idealistic. Americans were, were brought up, it's an idealistic country based on ideas of freedom and equality and uh, all this so that we're, we're brought up with with ideals of how things should be. <clears throat> but living in northeast Thailand at Wat Pa Nong Pa Pong, Lung Pa Cha's monastery was, it wasn't an ideal monastery, it was a, a living experience. Of, you know, it was very, in those days, now it's quite modernized, but uh, 40, 40 years ago it was very primitive kind of forest place uh, with no luxuries, no modern conveniences, no uh, high-tech of any sort. The most high-tech thing we had in the monastery was a pulley over the well. So <laughs> and yet, uh, you know, because of the attitude of Ajahn Chah and the, and the Thai monks living there, they were, you know, they, they had a kind of earthiness, a groundedness that wasn't based on thinking about how they wanted life to be, but observing the way it is. Well, this was, this was a new experience for me because I never lived with such people before. You know, from my own uh, cultural background, education. I mean, uh, you know, going to universities and 
and so forth. Those, I have, you know, I knew how life should be, how I wanted life to be, how, you know, and, and I was very critical of the way it is. When I was a student in the University of California, you know, students, university students, know everything. Now, at age 75, I realize I don't know anything. But when I was, <laughs> when I was a youth, I, um, my mother said when I was 18, I knew everything. <laughs> a know-it-all, in other words. Because, and then through 40, 43 years of monastic life, you realize you don't know anything, really. So you ask me, what, what have you gained? Uh, what have you achieved in de devoting your life to Buddhist monasticism and the Thai forest tradition? And it's not about gaining. It's about letting go. So it's, it's the reverse of all worldly conditioning. And it's not about achieving, gaining, acquiring, getting something you don't have, uh, trying to make a perfect monastery, a perfect society, perfect uh, political system, economy, etc. But it's, uh, you know, the monastic form itself lends it, it's designed to, for relinquishing or letting go. Because it's through letting go they, that we recognize the path or non-suffering or the end of suffering. And so during this winter's retreat, it is important to, to keep this, to reflect, to remind yourself, because it, our tendency, cultural tendencies, is always to blame. If I get what I need, then I can practice. If I, if, you know, if, I, if we could change things so that I'm happy or feel secure, then I can really practice. Or, uh, you know, always wanting something you don't have, or not wanting things to be the way they are. Now these are the desires, the dhanha of the second noble truth. Now in the northeast Thailand, in the, in, in, you know, 40 years ago, it was very undeveloped part of Thailand. Uh, but over the years now it's very modern with good roads and so forth. But, but uh, and also it's changing, it's losing that sense of, of uh, it's becoming very westernized, western values creeping in. Some of them good, some of them not very good. So it's not, I'm not against progress or, or you know, trying to improve things. But the way out of suffering is not through looking outward, but through looking inward. And so this Four Noble Truths is, uh, is the skillful means the Buddha uh, left us to, you know, if we follow the directions, they're very clear actually, it's very, very clear the teaching. It's not, it's not a, a fuzzy kind of abstract thing. It's not philosophical, not metaphysical in its approach. But it is encouraging awakened attention to the present, to the way it is, to the body, to your own body, rather than somebody else's. Attention not to criticizing it or making any problems, but just noticing. So intuitive awareness is our ability to observe the physical body, just the posture, that you're in right now, sitting, is like this. So this sounds rather simple-minded in a way. Who cares about, you know, should, how should I sit then is the next question. It's not about how you sit, or, uh, but observing. Observing the posture, the, this body that you identify with, and it's what it's doing at this moment. It's sitting, and then breathing is like this. Then we're aware of, of the, say, the mood or the state of mind we're in. Of what happens to be, you know, pleasure, pleasant sensations or painful ones. 
Uh, but our relationship to pleasure and pain, to feeling, to the physical realm, the sense realm, the emotional realm, the sense realm, in all its various aspects, this is knowing it. All conditions are impermanent. The faith on Quran each hour. So this is repeated over and over again till eventually the penny drops, as they say. It begins to sink in. Now over the years, say this year, this Vasa will be my forty fourth year as a bhikkhu. So that's quite a long time to devote yourself to investigating suffering. And <laughs> uh, but uh, that's been my main practice for 44 years, is uh, this, this simple teaching of the Four Noble Truths. So I do have experience, and, I'm, in, and it is uh, something I've, I've developed from even the first year when I was a Samanera. Uh, before I met Ajahn Chah. Just using this as a, and referring always to the present moment. If I'm suffering, what am I attached to, is the question. If, there's, if I'm feeling unhappy or anxious or worried or discontented or angry or jealous or frightened or whatever, from extreme emotion to just subtle movements of anxiety, worry, sadness, loneliness. When you are mindful of it, or when you attach to it, or suppress it. So attachment or clinging to conditioned phenomena can be either through grasping it or trying to get rid of it. It's always this, this struggling motion. Want, if you've got something you have that you want to keep, trying to hang on to it, or if you don't like it, wanting to get rid of it. So you can see this realm that we're living in, this sense realm, human realm, planetary life, is about birth and death. That's its nature, is beginning and ending, arising and ceasing. It's about sensitivity, about pleasure, pain. It's not about permanent happiness, and security, or making the planet into what we desire it to be. We're not God, we cannot, you know, transform conditioned phenomena according to our desires. So, our relationship to phenomena is then to observe it, to recognize it, to realize it. And that which is aware of phenomena is not phenomenon, not a phenomenon. That is the path. So over the years, I had the insights, uh, the first year in fact, but 44 years has given me a chance to really develop this path. So that it's, you know, it, it's uh, something it, it's reality. It's, a, it's very simple. Awaken attention in the present moment. And yet, because that sounds so simple and easy in its way, it's not. It's simple enough, but not easy because we are the owners of our karma, heir to our karma, born of our karma, and so forth. We're karmic formations in the process of change. And so we've got to deal with the changing conditions that we experience, whether we like them or not, whether they're happy, sad, success, failure, praise, blame, whatever they might be. Our relationship to conditioned phenomena then is knowing rather than uh, controlling, manipulating, identifying with any conditions, no matter how subtle or refined or how coarse. So this is why this emphasis on mindfulness, sati sampachanya, these two words in Pali, 
being able to reflect this moment here and now, like we, we, we start with maybe, I want to become enlightened. I'm going to practice in order to get enlightenment. And most of us start with that, that hope. Or we hope to attain some kind of spiritual state or some realm of happiness or bliss or rapture or um, whatever, however we might perceive the, the result of Buddhist meditation. The enigmatic term nirvana, what does that mean? Nirvana. And um, we think, I'd like to attain nirvana. But nibbana is not attainable. You don't attain it. So this is where even the language gets in the way. Not an attainment. Because it's, it's recognizable through awareness. In other words, the deathless, the unborn, uncreated, is here and now. It's not something you lack or you need to get. It's just something you don't notice. It's that which you're heedless of because of your vipaka karma, your attachments, conditioning to the, to the mental states, emotional states, physical body, cultural conditioning, your own views and opinions. So, in other words, there is a, I feel very grateful for having this long a lifespan to, to cultivate this, to develop this. Because it, it's, uh, one does lose it, you know, you, you have insights and then you, then the, the uh, urgency of the world impinges on you. There's always a crisis, an issue. Uh, uh, something to a problem. There's always uh, something wrong we have to make right. There's always, you know, then there's all kinds of things in the society, in the communities, and so forth we have to deal with uh, that are, seem important or urgent. And then we take on responsibilities. We become teachers and abbots of monasteries and so forth. And then we we have responsibilities, duties, and that brings up all kinds of sense of I am, I have to be responsible, and onward the whole sense of the self is promoted by positioning. By how we identify ourselves in the structure we're in. And so the, but the aim of our lives is Letting go, liberation, uh, non-attachment. And that, of course, easy to say. And this you have to recognize in your here. Do jit practice in your, in your jitta, in your mind, in your heart. You have to observe. Be the observer, not the judge, not the owner, but the observer, the puru or the Puto. So this retreat, winter's retreat, is an uh, is, uh, opportunity to continue this. It's an ongoing, relentless, ongoing determination. You have to have a strong determination. Not a willful sense of, I'm going to get enlightened, that doesn't work. But it's through a kind of this, the, the vehicle, uh, the Vinaya, and the tradition is a, an expedient means that's here available to us uh, f- so that we don't have to devote all our attention to worldly matters and problems but to practice. That's our, that's our, if you want to have a duty, that's your, our duty is to observe. But don't take that personally because it gets in the way too. <laughs> if you can see what I mean, where 
And the Samana life is not about achieving, attaining, or happiness, or security, but its very basis is insecurity. You're committing yourself to an insecurity, to depending on, on others for basic necessities. And so it, it is a, it's a rather unique thing that, that our culture doesn't really appreciate. You know, we don't understand it really because our, you know, speaking for myself, it's all about finding security. Finding happiness in the world. <clears throat> I remember, you know, the growing up and the sense of anxiety always in my parent with my parents about the future. About what if and what might happen. And there's a, you know, they went through the, I was born in the middle of the depression in the 1930s. And my parents, I guess, lost everything they had in the Depression. So that they were very conditioned to worry, what if that happens again? And so it, it's, uh, and they didn't, uh, they had no clue about looking at your mind. They had just worried whenever there was any sign of, uh, of an economic crash. I'm, I'm glad that they're now, it's been 20 years since they died. I'm glad they don't have to experience because they definitely worry about, even though they'd be over a <laughs> hundred. Because that's their vipaka kama, is to worry. <clears throat> but worry is, is uh, also can be seen. You know, if you're worried, that worrying is like this. You know you're worried. Or if you're angry, you know. I feel angry because you said this to me. Or you feel greedy, you want something you don't have. Or you feel uh, lonely, or upset, or anxious, or whatever. There's a knowing, isn't it? You know what you're feeling. Because when we, when we do get angry, we say, I feel angry. Unless we're in total denial of our feelings. But even when we deny it, we kind of know it anyway, that, that I'm angry or frightened. It's like this. Now that knowing, that knowing that you feel anger is not anger. So that's the puto, that's the, the knowing, the puru of anger is, is a condition that arises and ceases. According to your karma, when certain conditions come together in the present moment, you get angry. You feel this anger arising. That's just the way it is. You know, so somebody uh, abuses me or calls me a nasty name. Conditions for anger, say at this moment, arise and be aware of the arising of this feeling. It's a vipaka kama. The more you develop this awareness, then you, you, you still have to experience your vipaka kama, but you don't grasp it. It's just this knowing where anger, the vipaka kama of having been angry before well, under certain conditions, when they come together, then this is, this is what is happening at this moment. And through this awareness, then we we, we we may forget it and grasp, but then, as you investigate the four noble truths, you you uh, see how not to even grasp the karma of the present moment. Now, this is very subtle, but it is possible. It is, uh, you know, the Buddhist teaching that this realm is all about greed. Hatred, delusion, isn't it? It's all about survival of the fittest, learning how to survive in this realm where all the creatures are eating each other, 
Whereas, you know, we, we do have, you know, human society, we can make uh, moral agreements not to kill each other and so forth. But still, we, we still have this animal karma of survival. And, uh, and that's, this realm is about surviving, procreating, sexual desire, procreating the species, is natural sensory energy that we experience through these forms. And our relationship to them then is knowing rather than grasping, rejecting, identifying with them. So I'm, I'll, uh, I also many of you have probably heard uh, by now that I'm planning on retiring. And uh, because the uh, first time in my monastic life I think I'm... Uh, I have this experience to be free from duties. So I've invited Ajahn Amaral, who's now at Bayagiri. He's agreed to come and take on the duties of the uh, uh, abbot or the position here. And uh, he's he coming on my invitation and have consulted with uh, many of the senior bhikkhus and, uh, and it's all uh, agreeable. He, Ajahn Amro has been a, a disciple and a very uh, gifted monk, someone I trust, and uh, who is also British. And he helped in the early years of establishing this monastery. So... Uh, at the end of the Vasa after the Katina, uh, if my karma allows it, I will be a free man, a free monk. And uh, this I've never been because I've, I've either as a junior monk bound to uh, certain monasteries and then to uh, establishing monasteries. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity to uh, to uh, have at the end of my life uh, such an opportunity to uh, to not be continuously bound by the the kind of duties of uh, head monk, upachaya, and all the rest. So then you ask me, <clears throat> what do you plan to do? <laughs> And I'm just, uh, I've decided not to try to figure that out. <laughs> and uh, even though the tendency, personal tendency, is wanting certainty for the future, I can see the, the ridiculousness of that, of trying to set myself up uh, into some kind of secure position, but in just trusting in the, in the Dhamma for the future, whatever form it takes, whatever conditions arise. So this is, a, a, and I have the words, walk my talk, as they say, <laughs> or practice what I preach. So it is kind of putting into practice the, the uh, you know, this, this real sum in our life, which is, uh, you know, as I'm, getting lots of offers, interesting offers and possibilities. But uh, basically, uh, I don't have any plans other than uh, breathing in, breathing out, and whatever happens, whatever seems right. Now this has all come together in a natural way, not through <clears throat> any of my manipulations or anybody else's. It's not through through aversion or uh, or you know I do I have enjoyed living in England uh, and uh, here at Amravati Chitters so it's not about um, you know disillusionment or despair or negative uh, conditions are uh, you know, it's not through that that this is happening. It seems to be happening 
because of the conditions arise for this to happen. And uh, so I trust that. And then the change, you get attached, you know, you, you identify Amravati with, with a person, with me maybe, and that's something to look at, to observe, just to observe attachment to teachers, to uh, monks or nuns or whatever, is like this. I'm not saying you shouldn't attach, but whatever you're attached to, be the knower of it. That's all that's necessary. It's not about that you shouldn't be attached. So it's getting so familiar with the attachment, with clinging to conditioned phenomena. So that you, you know, you know it, you know it the minute that it happens. The tendency, the karmic tendency, is to attach, to control, to uh, manipulate conditioned phenomena. Whether it's your own mind or the uh, environment you're living in. So I offer this uh, as a reflection and information. <laughs>